Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll hear a musical performance from Elisa Corinne. But first, joining me now is Jerry Doan from the North Dakota Grazing Lands Coalition, or you're with them anyway. You Jerry, thanks for joining us today. Hey, it's great to be here. Fun to drive over today. Well, yeah, you came over and uh, from Bismarck, McKenzie area, but as we get started, we always do. Tell the folks about yourself, maybe where you're originally from. Well, I grew up there on the Black Leg Ranch, uh, south of McKenzie. I uh, was homesteaded in 1882 by my great-grandfather that had came out of Canada. At that time, it was still Dakota Territory, so even though this winter's been a little ugly and hairy, you know, he lived in a sod house. I don't think we can imagine just trying to stay warm and keep food on the table, what that was like. And I, w I came over here and... Uh, Lived in Fargo for a bit, went to NDSU and got a degree in, in animal science and had a lot of good times down here in Fargo and got married while I was down here and uh, we boomed back to the ranch and, and been there ever since. So. Well, with that said, because we, we were talking before we came on the air, sounds like you've got an interesting operation there, uh, you said around McKenzie, North Dakota. Talk about your place and what all goes on there. <laughs> Well, we, it is, you know, we've, we've got a lot of heritage, obviously. I'm the fourth generation. My kids have come back there. They're the fifth, and we're proud of that. That You know, it's not easy in agriculture. You're dealing with mud, Mother Nature, as we know, this winter, and, uh, and uh, things are a bit chaotic at times. But it's exciting. You know, we've built, when my kids came back, they built a, uh, we've got a, Rolling Plains Adventures, a full-fledged hunting outfitting business that's nationally acclaimed, been on many of the national hunting shows. And then my middle son, who had uh, worked for Anheuser-Busch, had moved around the country, went to Arizona State, never thought he'd come back, and, and he started agritourism. And so that's uh, spreading a positive message on agriculture. And so, you know, it, it's, it's been fun there. and, and uh, created some things that I wouldn't, uh, people asked me 10 years ago, did you ever think you'd be doing what you're doing today? And I said, never in a million years, so. <laughs> well, with that said, how many operators uh, venture into this agritourism? Do, do many, and uh, can it be a good source of income? Well, it certainly can, and in North Dakota, we don't have many. You go to some of the other states, like probably Tennessee, where you're from, you tell me, and they may have several hundred of them there. and. And we really need to spread a positive image about agriculture because when we bring folks to our, our ranch, I'm amazed at how little they know about agriculture and how they've got it from sound bites on the media. And generally, it's pretty negative. And then when they come and they see and they say, my goodness, you're engaged in trying to protect our natural resources and protect our water and all these things. And so... They always challenge me, spread the word because people don't know. And so it's, it's, a, it's fun, you meet a lot of good folks, and it's a niche that helps add income to a ranch that, uh, that makes it all work. Now on your ranch, are, are, are you raising uh, cattle is what you're doing? And do you, raise, do, you uh, do your own haying or what do you do? Yep, well we're still a cattle ranch and, and that's our main income. You know, we run a lot of Angus cattle. We, uh, have our own cow herd. We bring in uh, <clears throat> quite a few in the winter and, or um, excuse mm -hmm. me, in the summer and custom graze as well. And so it, it kind of fits in. And my youngest boy that just graduated from Montana State came back and he loves the cow end of it. And so it fits together with the other ventures, so. Okay, <clears throat> well now let's go to, I mentioned that you're with the North Dakota Grazing Lands Coalition. What is that? Well, the Grazing Lands Coalition, I've been involved in a number of groups over my life. This is one of my favorite because it's actually going out and educating and telling people about new ways to do things in, in animal agriculture and be successful. It's about bringing profitability back. It's about bringing the younger generation back and how can we do that? And then it's about improving our quality of life because so often in agriculture, you're so busy work and work and working that your quality of life goes to heck. And we're trying to bring that back. And so we've got a group of mentors that, uh, like myself, that, and you can go to our website and look at that, but that actually will help producers look at some different ways of doing things that hopefully bring that profitability back, make it so it's fun again br by improving that quality of life. And then if you do have younger kids or the next generation want to come back, we're able to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, now, with that said, Maybe, I don't know how to ask this question, but like you've got a mentor network and 
is it members of the coalition or who, who you effectively, uh, how, how do they come to you or do you go to them? How, how does it work? Well, folks, well, uh, we do a number of things. We'll have educational events. We have a couple of workshops during the course of the year, and that's bringing in all producers that are interested. And, and we move them around the state, and so you, you know, watch our website. And we, we put out media on that. And so we'll get a lot of folks that come, and then they find out what we're about, and then they'll call us. I had a, a couple of phone calls yesterday, just producer wanting to know about cover crops and, and how can we winter graze cover crops and help improve and you know I don't have all the answers but I but I can give them my experience and help them along and and that's what we're all about so we're trying to uh, be a group that helps all producers that are looking for a different way to stay in business and and pass their family ranch on yeah and, and Jerry you mentioned the the this winter but uh, whether it's this winter or winter's past uh, how, how you do how do you deal with protecting the livestock feeding them and, and sort of just surviving the winter right well, let's face it, agriculture, no, no other business is dependent on Mother Nature like we are. And just when you think you're getting smart, she'll smack you around a little bit and make it, <laughs> make it interesting. But in, in our case on our ranch, to bring profitability back, we try to get rid of feed and much hay. And so we try to winter graze and we winter graze cover crops. Three goals in our, in our cover crops. Number one, to get rid of these winter feed costs. Number two, to bring uh, bring the uh, soil health back to that land, and number three, to propagate the wildlife. And we've been successful in that. But you've got to have a backup plan because we know where we live. We're in the northern plains, and North Dakota, this year it's proving it can be bitter. And so you may have to go in and feed for a while, you know. But what we do now is we feed out on the land, so we're not bringing them in to the riparian areas and into the watershed, so we're not putting that manure and urine into the Missouri River anymore. We're keeping it on the land, building soil health and improving that. And so in general, it works really good. Now, we've got, we're fortunate to have some, you mentioned uh, shelter, we've got windbreaks. My grandfather planned some really big windbreaks years ago, but we've also got some portable windbreaks that we pull around a bit, you know, when we get these bitter winds and these mm -hmm. storms and it's still not perfect, you know, you get, you get those tail enders that probably should have went to town or something, and these winters like this are tough on those kinds. So. Sure. Well, what about grazing land? Not necessarily, I don't know if you know the exact number of acres we've got, but what's happening to the grazing land in our region? Well, in my opinion, our grazing lands are a bit under assault in North Dakota. We've lost in 200 years 75% of our native grazing land, and I get it. You know, we're a very diverse egg egg economy and, and we've got a lot of folks farming and that's okay, I don't have a problem, we do some farming ourselves and I don't have a problem with that. But okay, if there's just 25% left, we maybe better pay attention because if we do like grassland birds and the wildlife and some of the beauty and all these things, we better pay attention and, and let's make sure we regenerate those grazing lands. You know, if you go back to when Lewis and Clark came, if you l read their journals, the grass was beautiful and abundant, and they say saddle high. And, and there were grizzly bears on the plains, and it's been years and years and years of season-long grazing has taken that species and narrowed it up and changed that. Now, if we go back in with rotational grazing, planned grazing, and move cattle frequently, all of a sudden we broaden those species again, and we bring that abundance back and that quality back, and protect that for generations to come. Yeah. Well, with that said, uh, you've, you've mentioned soil health two or three times. Right. Uh, can you talk more about managing soil health and systems, uh, I guess, the biodiversity there? Right. Well, I'm big into soil health, and if you, again, if you'd asked me this 20 years ago, I'd, I would have said, wow, I, I'm not sure I get that, you know. But it was about 20 years ago when we got into no-till, and. Uh, and I was slow to, you know, it was somewhat new at the time, and I'm like, boy, I don't see it. Now I'm like, man, I don't know what took me so long to get engaged, because it's huge. But trying to bring that diversity back in, and we do it through cover crops, many species of cover crops, and then it's bringing the biology back into the soil. And I, without trying to get too scientific, because I, I'm not a soil scientist, but when we see our soil biology going like this as we test it, that's telling us that we're bringing that back and that increases our organic matter again. What we've seen in these soils 
over years and years and years of tillage and constant uh, inputs, our, our soil biology is dropping and our soil uh, organic matter is falling off. And so our soil is becoming less healthy. By doing a few management practices, we can bring that back. And then it's, and I always say, you know, the buzzword in the country is we want to be sustainable. I don't want to be sustainable. I want to regenerate it. I don't want to sustain something that's degraded. I want to regenerate it back to before man was here and it was abundant. The organic matter was high and the biology was horrendous. You, yeah. know? Now you mentioned cover crops a, right? a few times. What's a cover crop? Well, a cover crop is basically, it's the buzzword in agriculture, you know, right or wrong. But what we're doing is taking like 20 species and it's, you know, from legumes to colliards to, to millets to ryegrass to sorghums, uh, uh, radish, all these different things, and, and that diversity in there brings biology back. It makes excellent feed for our cattle then. And then if you're into wildlife, and we are, and we love them, not only do we use it in, in our business, but we love them as a, as a good steward of the land, and it's great for feed and cover for wildlife. So it, it's a win-win for us. Okay. Uh, how does technology uh, assist in managing operations th these days? Well, technology is, uh, is good. I'm all for it. I'm, I think I'm progressive, but you've got to be careful to not jump into technology and then it comes around and bites you in the big picture. And so we're, we're a little bit trying to get back from the grazing coalition of using nature to our advantage, you know, calve within sync with nature. And that's, you know, we've, we changed our calving operation, uh, to me in June 20 years ago. That was the number one best economic decision we ever made. You know, yes, our calves are smaller, but we're having them when it's nice outside, it's fun to do, it brought our quality of life back. And then you have options of how you handle them. You can hold them over to go to grass or sell them to go to grass. And so the profitabilities went up because your inputs have went way down. So. There's a, you know, and you can use technology where it fits, but, but I always caution folks, don't let technology drive you. Try to work with Mother Nature and the things we have and then fit technology in where it fits. Okay. Uh, let's turn to, uh, I guess, the America's Grassland Conference coming up in August. Uh, sure. What is that about? Well, it's a group, uh, I, I was asked to come and speak to the American Grasslands Conference last year in Texas, and I had not been involved in it. And it's all the conservation and wildlife groups, some of these groups I'd never even heard of that come together for this conference. And it's exciting to have it come to Bismarck because, and they've, what they've not done before, and they started it last year, is bringing landowners and producers in and have them be a part of the program. That's so important for these wildlife and conservation groups to actually hear from landowners and producers of what makes them tick. And so it's fun to have it come to, to Bismarck. I think we'll have an excellent opportunity to showcase North Dakota and North Dakota producers in that. And I'm really looking forward to it. I, and we're going to bring them to the ranch. We're going to show them uh, some things we're doing. So. Okay. Do you know how many folks would attend something like that? Oh, there'll be several hundred that, that come to this. It was, it was quite an event in uh, Texas, and now we've got to show them some North Dakota hospitality. Okay. Uh, let's talk a minute about grazing lands. How are they designated, whether they're federal or private? Well, years back when uh, the grazing lands that are uh, government-owned in North Dakota was back in the... 30s when when the agriculture was in terrible shape a lot of that land was lost and the federal government took them over and so those are federal lands now and we don't have a huge amount in north dakota we have some in the west but you get into your further west states it's a big deal you know where 90 percent in a, in a few states is all federally owned and that's challenging because uh, you know we've had some issues between producers and and the federal government i think we're seeing some hope and I think if we start showing them that we can do a better job as stewards of the land, and again, selling that to the public and getting them on our side, that the worst thing you can do is take the livestock off the land, it will start to desertify. You have to use it. It's what made the grassland so abundant before Lewis and Clark came was those big herds of buffalo. 
when you had or bison when you had mm -hmm. two three four hundred thousand they came through they almost annihilated it but they didn't come back and graze for two or three years that's what we do with intensive planned grazing it's mimicking that and we do it with fencing and and hemming cattle in but that's so when you take cattle off the land like some groups want in the in the uh, west government lands that actually takes you backwards instead of forwards yeah in fact it's becoming a dispute in some states uh, sometimes even violent I yeah guess, it yeah. is and that's unfortunate part of that is education again i get back to agritourism bringing folks in talking about those issues showing them that hey we're on your side we want we want to propagate the wildlife we want to make our natural resources better and when they hear that story they're like wow we we are with you you know okay so what is holistic management? Well, holistic management is a term, uh, Alan Savory, if you've heard of him, Alan Savory did a lot of work in, in Africa. I took my holistic training from Alan Savory and uh, it basically is looking at the whole picture. Instead of, you know, I always say, uh, when you come out of higher education, you're trained a bit in black and white and you're looking for a textbook answer all the time. And life or Ranching doesn't work that way. You've got to step back, look at the whole picture, and as you add uh, processes or ideas, how does it affect the whole thing? And when you do that, you can bring profitability and that quality of life back. So it's, it's just a, it's somewhat simple when you think of it, but yet we, have, we struggle with it because we're not trained that way to think about the whole all the time and, and using common sense and then using nature to your benefit. And, but it's made a quite a difference. I've had all my kids go through it on our place and it's made a, quite a difference in our operation. Uh, Jerry, I understand if somebody wants a ranch wedding, you're the guy to see. <laughs> well, actually it would be my sons, but, <laughs> but you know, it, it kind of happened strictly by accident. My middle son came back and he got married on the ranch and then somebody liked so, was there and thought it was kind of cool and would you do one and then we did a couple and and then Jay talked to me and talked to me to to uh, let him take over one of the barns and make it into an event center I fought him for a while <laughs> but I finally came to the conclusion when you get these kids that come back to the ranch and the operation you can't stand in their way they've got new ideas it's been really good we have quite a few weddings in the summer and and we host corporate events we uh, you know, lots of soil health tours, pasture management tours, and all different kinds of things. And then we get to tell the story of agriculture. So it, it's fun. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to one. You sure. talked about no-till. I remember 20, 25 years ago right. in Tennessee, uh, having a lot of uh, going out and visiting and seeing where they were doing right. no-till. Why, why was no-till important for us to, con I guess, convert to? Right. It, well, and in North Dakota, particularly Western North Dakota, we're always short of moisture, and no-till's a no-brainer, and, and I didn't understand it, but as we start to build that litter on the ground, it lowers our soil temperature, and it, it allows for the water that we get to infiltrate, and we're not running it down the hill, and it's not going into the, to the excuse me, into the watershed. So it's probably one of the best practices that we've could have done to help us bring the soil health and biology back, so. Yeah, you mentioned next generation. For you, it seems to be working well, so, but what is the future for our next generations of ranchers and farmers? Well, I'm a real optimist on agriculture, but that doesn't mean it doesn't come with challenges. And I get really frustrated in agriculture that we put it in a box, and, and many of our programs and even our financial institutions look at it how many cows do you have or how many bushels of wheat do you grow? And I'm arguing with them all the time, you can't do that. Just like agritourism or a hunting venture or maybe it's uh, taking a beef product and finding a niche and doing something different. And you've got to let these young kids come back with new fresh ideas. We can still be ranchers, we can still be farmers, but you've got to let them go out a bit or else we'll struggle with that. The commodity business is a tough business because it's up and down and, and you well know, I went through the 80s. The producers I admired the most, they're not there. They didn't make it, you know, and, and I don't want to see that again. And so I think there's some real opportunity in it. It's, in my case, I've got four kids, they all came back. Our, our daughter is not directly involved, 
but she does a lot with our operations, and it's exciting. Jerry, we're out of time, but if people want more information, where can they go? Go to our website, the North Dakota Grazing Lands Coalition website. Right. It was great. It was fun being here. Thanks for joining yeah, us. Thank today. you, sir. Right. <laughs> Stay tuned for more. Singer-songwriter Elisa Corinne of New York Mills, Minnesota, writes original songs about historical figures and events of the Northern Plains. Here's a look at the characters and the rowdy bootleggers of the Prohibition era. One of my favorite stories of live performance is that I was performing in a town in Minnesota. I'm not going to reveal any names of people or towns here because I don't want to get anyone in trouble. Um, but what happened was I have a song in my Minnesota's Ordinarily Unsung concert about moonshine. It's about a bootlegger named Joseph Studer who made moonshine. And I performed it in a small town uh, in Minnesota, the show, and uh, one of the audience members came up to me afterwards and said, oh, have you ever tasted moonshine? And, and I hadn't. And I told him that. And he said, oh, that's such a pity. And I said, I know. I, I wish I could taste moonshine because I'm singing about it. And he goes, well, I have a friend. You know, I have a friend. My friend makes moonshine. And I was like, oh, well, too bad your friend isn't here and brought his moonshine. And he goes, yeah, too bad. Well, two days later, I had a, another performance in another town at a library. And uh, the head of the library comes up to me and said, you, you got a package in the mail. And I'm thinking, I don't live anywhere near here. How did I get a package in the mail here? Well, I open up this package and I discover in it a pint-sized Jägermeister bottle that was half filled with what I knew at that point was not Jägermeister, but rather moonshine. And there was a um, piece of notebook paper with one line <laughs> penciled on it and no signature. It just said, enjoy. <laughs> and I was like, all right. So I got my first taste in moonshine because uh, someone knew that I wanted it. <laughs> Barkeep, I see a bottle there I haven't seen in many a year. Studer's moonshine better than beer. The best brew in the land. They cheer the best brew in the land. 1920 prohibition decreed. No drinking was the law to eat. My crop failed. I was in need. Had a wife and ten kids to feed. Indeed, a wife and ten kids to feed. Moonshine, moonshine, the brew was mine. I made the best in the land. Moonshine, moonshine, illegal lifeline. Gave my family a hand. It was simple to make a still in a chop. Use a wash boiler with a copper top. Put a tube on it in the shop and weld the top to the pot. That's all you weld the top to the pot. Dry corn and yeast, raisins and prunes, apricots and sugar. Put it all in a clean oak barrel once used for vinegar. That was once used for vinegar. Moonshine, moonshine, the brew was mine. I made the best in the land. Moonshine, moonshine, illegal lifeline. Gave my family a hand. Lawmen would head our way, Sheriff Dan would call to betray. The feds are coming and planning a raid, so we'd move the still far away. We would, we'd hide the still far away. The piano was our whiskey cash, the feds once came to find our stash. To the piano, young Jenny did dash, she played till the feds left her bashed. At twelve, played till the feds left her bashed. Moonshine, moonshine, the brew was mine. I made the best. miss the danger and risk I don't really miss making brew but seeing that old Studer's bottle there I can't help remembering the smell in the air the sour stench of prohibition time as the mash fermented for our brew so fine as I made world-class moonshine as I made Studer's moonshine Studer's moonshine Moonshine, moonshine, the brew was mine I made the best in the land Moonshine, moonshine, illegal lifeline Gave my 
my family I had Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>